Wonderful. Okay, hello everyone. It's about the time to start. Please take a seat. And thank you so much for coming to Eco Research and in your meeting. Uh, I'm Moon Choi, uh, the one of the co-leader of the Research Coalition. We are very excited, that, you know, to see you finally in person. So uh, this Ecology Research Coalition annual meeting has uh, several goals, and then uh, the moderator, the, the coordinator, the tailor is uh, uh, distributing the documents, mm -hmm. and this is a concept note. So as you know, that Ecology Research Coalition. Uh, is really working hard to provide more evidence about the evaluation, uh, the, the evidence-based policy. And if you go to the the second, you know there are more details. But before going through the overall, you know, overarching goals, I would like to introduce, uh, you know, uh, our colleague. The Kara was not be able to make this, so we have, uh, you know, the the colleague from the ITU. So he's going to give uh, over op opening speech. So. Please. Thank you, Professor. Uh, so again, um, I send, you know, Carla sends her apologies. Uh, so my name is Pritam Malur. Uh, I'm a colleague of Carla at the ITU, and I head the Emerging Technologies Division there. Uh, so uh, this, I have, uh, you know, uh, Carla has been a close colleague, so I've interacted with her over the years. Uh, but I have to admit uh, that, you know, uh, I haven't been totally up to speed on the research coalition, so maybe this is the opportunity. Uh, so uh, let me just uh, you know give you some short remarks uh, again uh, on behalf of Carla and on behalf of the ITU. So it's a pleasure to be here today. You know uh, it's to see you all at the Equals uh, Research Coalition, uh, uh, to see the partners uh, united in person after more than a year. And again, thank you very much to Kest and to Georgia Tech uh, for leading the work of the coalition. And uh, you know the coalition plays a very pivotal role in our collective action uh, and our collective mission. You know the primary goals, of course, includes ensuring that the practitioners and the policymakers have the intelligence they need to make informed decisions and to drive evidence-based uh, actions. Uh, and we achieve this by identifying you know key knowledge and evidence gaps, conducting research on priority topics providing practitioners and policymakers with actionable information. So why does it all matter? You know, uh, strong, credible data, case studies are vital to understand the problem, uh, recognize successful strategies, identify gaps and opportunities. And uh, this enables us to move on, you know, move towards uh, bridging the uh, digital gender divide. This is a vital piece, of course. And it's of utmost importance that we continue and we reinforce the work of uh, publishing reports, collecting data, informing other equals coalitions, you know, the access, skills, and leadership uh, pillars. And we have some great achievements as a, co as a coalition here. You know, an example, this, uh, the taking stock report, data and evidence on gender equality in digital access, skills, and leadership, which served as the inaugural report of the research coalition. The most uh, recent accomplishment is the report on sex uh, disaggregated ICT data in Africa. Uh, I'm also pleased to highlight the flagship project Equals EU, uh, which is uh, Europe's reg regional partnership on gender equality in the digital age. Uh, it aims to promote gender equality in social innovation through capacity building and creating smart, sustainable, and inclusive social innovation systems. Uh, in local communities and in cities in Europe and the global north and south. Uh, so the collaborative efforts of the partners from all over Europe have manifested in activities such as hackathons, innovation camps, a three-week uh, summer school, and the development of gender equality tools, uh, gender equity tools. So uh, together we are making significant strides towards uh, gender digital equity. And I'm excited to see the impactful work that lies ahead for our research coalition. Again, you know, thank you very much for your dedication and continued uh, contribution. Thank you very much, Professor. Thank you, thank you so much for the opening speech by ITU and uh, the representative. And now we are moving to the the program. So if you see the third page, uh, the tentative agenda, uh, the uh, the. IT, uh, the support team, would you uh, show the, the tentative? Yes, the next page. Next, next. That's the first page, so would you move to the third one? 
Next. Yeah. So uh, this is the program of uh, today's meeting. So uh, we will uh, give you the, the uh, you, you know, the time to introduce yourself. Uh, we have uh, old friends and also new faces. So we would like to hear who you are and your research interest maybe briefly. Uh, from here, uh, I'll give you the mic. Yeah, from the Christopher, the, uh, the Professor Christopher Yu. Uh, I'm Christopher Yu at the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, we are, among other things, most relevantly in the space, doing empirical work to try to understand the impact of mobile internet connectivity on socioeconomic well-being with gender, particularly fun uh, projects funded by uh, GSMA Women. Uh, to really f try to understand the dynamics of how that works. Uh, we're doing a longitudinal study in Bangladesh and Ghana. Uh, we have the baseline done. We're currently uh, in the process of funding and uh, fielding the end line to try to see uh, what that's going to be. And uh, we're doing other things in school connectivity and other assessment means. And uh, happy to talk about any of that. Hello, my name is Maria Garrido. I come from the University of Washington Information School, and I'm here with my colleague, Matias Centeno, from the Institute, National Institute of Technology and Agriculture. And my research we center mainly in trying to find alternative measures for finding the progress on bridging the digital divide. And um, yeah, thank you very much, Dr. Professor Moon, for the invitation, and we're very happy to be here. Thank you. My name is Pranav. I work with the Internet Society Foundation, and uh, we work towards connecting the unconnected, among many other projects. And uh, we don't only conduct research, but we also fund researchers in this area. So uh, please feel free to go through our website, and I'll be happy to connect you with more colleagues on that space. Thank you. Hello, my name is Munyo Lang, and I'm a master student of KAIST. Who is Moon Cho is my one of my advisors, <laughs> and I'm working on uh, how the diversity, including women, uh, gender equality, uh, performs a the in the pro productivity productivity in defense industry area. Thank you. Hi, uh, good afternoon. My name is Oni Kamakwakwa. I'm the executive director at the Global Digital Inclusion Partnership. Uh, where we work on meaningful connectivity for the global majority. You would uh, know uh, our work as the team that uh, led the Alliance for Affordable Internet in the past. Uh, we're doing research currently on the cost of exclusion, looking at the economic impact of excluding women from the digital economy. I'm Kenneth. I work with Onika with GDIP. Hi, my name is Gaini. I'm uh, from Lonesia. We're a regional think tank working across the Asia Pacific, uh, particularly in developing Asia. Um, I think my colleagues Helani and Aisha have worked very closely with Equals in the past, and I'm here on their behalf. Uh, we do a lot of work. Uh, we, in terms of gender, we look at uh, we do nationally representative surveys, looking at uh, breakdowns by gender, but also looking at other things like urban rural divides, disability, and whatnot. So we've done uh, nationally representative surveys in the past across six Asian countries, and we just did one uh, in post-COVID to look at the changes in digital inclusion gaps. Uh, due to COVID, looking at the gender elements of people coming online, whether uh, COVID actually got more women to come online because of you know, needing to help their children with their educational needs, what that did for platform work. And we also have just concluded some qualitative research to look at how uh, women have um, sort of operated in the platform economy, particularly in the context of COVID. So very much looking at that intersection of gender and the digital economy amongst other things. Thank you. Hello everyone, uh, nice to meet you all. And I'm uh, with the same school of graduate, School of Science and Technology Policy um, with Professor Moon Choi. Uh, and uh, my name is So Young Kim. I am a political scientist by training, but these days I'm doing much more on uh, how women can be more promoted in the fields of science and technology. And over the last few years, uh, actually, not few, but several years, I've been working as an advisor to the Ministry of Education uh, 
chairing the committee to promote women in university uh, faculty uh, as a whole. And also uh, uh, for that, we have been actually uh, evaluating 39 national universities over more than 20 years in terms of uh, whether new faculty members are uh, new faculty members around the nation have a sufficient uh, portion of uh, women uh, in the new cohorts and also in terms of uh, how women actually get promoted over the long uh, track, you know, from assistant to associate and full professors. And lately, I've been involved in um, advising and actually creating the fifth basic framework for uh, women in science and technology. And so my, I guess uh, I'm dealing with the question of uh, double mar marginalization in uh, SNT because uh, women are very much underrepresented in SNT as general, but also especially in terms of uh, digital technologies, uh, latest di digital technologies like AI, women are much more uh, less uh, represented. Uh, so somehow I got involved <laughs> in this uh, equals because of uh, Professor Moon Choi, but we have a new faculty member and I guess we will be Maybe taking a greater role in the next few years. Thank you. Um, hi, lovely to meet you. My name is Dasum Lee. I joined KAIST STP a year ago um, from now, and I study AI based infrastructures and cyber physical systems. Um, so, more specifically, I look at how AI can be used in the energy systems and self driving cars and how they can support. Uh, environmental and social sustainability. And more specifically regarding gender, I'm looking at how women understand um, or ha how women have access to this new and emerging technology in a very different way compared to um, their ma male counterparts. So how they use these technologies, how they, um, how they are considered as a market in a very different way. So often with self-driving self -driving cars, women are not considered as the primary uh, buyer but um, but women actually do show a significant interest in these new and emerging technologies. So that's one of my research interests. And um, I'm very new to eCalls, but I'm very excited to be here. And I recognize some of the faces that I saw on Zoom, which is always nice. Um, so lovely to meet you. So um, hello, everyone. It's so nice to meet you all here. Uh, I'm a PhD student in the Graduate School of Science and Technology in KAIST. So I'm uh, assisting uh, Professor Moon Choi to coordinate uh, this session. And um, my interest that related to the gender digital divide is about the gender gap, um, about how internet use really impact the real life experience. So. Um, in overall, I focus on the third level digital divide um, in the gender perspective. So it's um, nice to meet you all, and I uh, look forward to talking more about these topics more. Yes. Um, hi, everybody. My name is Taylor DeRosa. I'm also working with Professor Moon Choi. I'm a master's student in the School of Science and Technology Policy at KAIST. Um, and my research mainly focuses on actually also looking at the digital divide, but through the lens of the North Korean refugee migrants living in South Korea. And I also look at some intersections like gender and um, age as well, in terms of how different uh, forms of internet use relate to their social relationships and resources. So it's really nice to see you all in person. Hello, my name is Yvonne Sun, and my advisor is Dasom Lee, and I'm from, I also from Graduate School of uh, science, science, science and Technology Policy, and nice to meet you all. I, I'm interested in mostly about AI and energy, but I think what, what uh, uh, democratic values like equal treats is very important for this, that new technology, so thank you. Uh, thank you so much for the uh, introduction. There's always uh, one, two person who speak long, but somehow today <laughs> everyone, you know, introduced themselves very briefly, so we are on time. So uh, I'm Moon Choi, and I'm a, a professor at KAIST, and actually my research background is more social welfare policy and gerontology, but recently we have completed a project about 
gender inequality in AI labor force. So we have uh, some empirical data, and also recently uh, I have been involved in the uh, NIA, the it is called NIA in Korea, National Information Agency, about the IAC project, that's the uh, Information Assessment Center around the uh, developing countries. So I really look forward to working with the many uh, you know partners in this room. And okay, so now we are moving to the Ah, okay. Yes, yeah. Thank you for the, the reminder. Okay. Okay, so would you please uh, show the Zoom, uh, the participant on the screen? So. How many are in the Zoom? Three, okay. Can you hear their voice? Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Ariana? Ariana, can you uh, introduce yourself? and uh, I am trying to get my video up, but I'm having, okay, I think you can see me now, wonderful. I am originally from Jamaica, and I am an aerospace engineer by training and technology policy specialist. I'm based at Oslo Metropolitan University, and I'm working with how we can create gender inclusive innovation ecosystems and within this space i'm very involved and affiliated with the equals eu project and very excited about the synchronies i can form with the equals eu research coalition and it's important work thank you wonderful thank you and the next person Burhanu. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Oh, wonderful. My name is Burhanu Nugusi from Federal Democratic Republic of Ethiopia. Actually, I am Pan-African Youth Ambassador for Internet Governance. And I am actively working with my chapter, uh, Ethiopian chapter, Internet society, and also I am uh, involving in civil society to uh, solve the problems of uh, internet related issues. Today, I'm happy to be here with you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Okay, the next person is Professor uh, Park. Hello, do you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Thank you very much, Professor Choi. Uh, my name is Kyung Park. I'm from Kais. Um, uh, I'm actually literally um, at the conference venue, and then my on-site registration actually is the temporary unavailable. Was just like so. Um, I'm sorry for that. <laughs> sorry that I was not able to just come in. But I have been just uh, um, you know, listening to your all the introductions possible and to see you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And the the next person is Pasi. Hello. Yes, we can hear you. I'm not sure with them. You're hearing me? Oh. Yes. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Percy. 
and um, from Uganda, the Center for Middle Interest and Community Involvement. I actually just joined and uh, I, I think that the introduction I, I can do. I'm really happy to be here and to be joining this session. And I'm looking forward to listening to insights about uh, internet governance. It's my first time attending this conference. So I'm really looking forward to a lot of learning. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And also we have a new uh, uh, attendant, attend in the back, uh, would you please introduce yourself, your name and your affiliation and your uh, research or your, you know, the, the work, the priorities and interest? Um, my name is Toshikazu Sakano uh, from uh, Advanced Research <laughs> Advanced Research Institute for Telecommunications. International based in Kyoto, and I'm uh, doing a research on disaster, uh, ICT for disaster countermeasure and uh, gro global team. We are uh, we we are con we are doing some feasibility studies in many countries. So I, I'm interested in global collaboration. That's why I'm here. Thank you. Thank you. Hello everyone, I'm Chandra Prakash Sharma, CEO and founder at Bizflux, uh, based in India. We are collaborating with uh, Dr. Sakano and uh, Mr. Jeffrey here from Philippines on the locally accessible cloud system project. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, I'm Jeffrey Lianto. I'm the executive director of the uh, CVSNAP Foundation based in the Philippines. Uh, we are working on the uh, wireless communication during disaster, working with uh, Dr. Sakano and Mr. Sharma for this one to be implemented to the other countries also. Thank you very much. Thank you. And also we have a new, a new uh, participant here. Uh, I'm Honorable Ayobangira Safari. I'm an MP from uh, DRC Congo. Uh, uh, thank you. Thank you so much. Is there any that I missed? No? Okay, we are good. Thank you very much. And uh, so now we are moving to the next agenda. So uh, the primary purpose of this meeting is uh, to, you know, the discuss about the next annual report. As you know, that Equals Research Coalition have two primary goals. The first one is about the, you know, the, the uh, annual meeting, and second one is annual report. So. Maybe Taylor, can you give an overview about what we have done for uh, the brief uh, presentation? Would, would you be able to do so? The PowerPoint? Yeah. Uh, you're not, uh, uh, okay. Uh, because we have a new uh, members here, so it would be nice to have a, a brief overview about what we have done. So before moving to the next agenda. So Ecos has, uh, uh, you know, started uh, from 2016 uh, by the collaboration efforts of five partners, that's ITU, GSMA, uh, United Nations University, and uh, UN Women, uh, and also ITC. So five uh, partners started this Equals, and the primary purpose is a global partnership, you know, to promote gender equality, so we have a four coalition. One is uh, assess, a uh, second is uh, skills and leadership and research. So this is uh, one of the coalition and our, uh, you know, our goal is to, uh, you know, help to do evidence-based policy. So uh, uh, Taylor is uh, uh, one of our uh, coordinator with the Anchan and she's going to give an overview about what we have done for a year. Okay, so uh, 
as you may know that uh, we started 2006, uh, six, uh, uh, 2016, and then uh, UNUCS was a very active leader of this research coalition. But there's up and downs, and then you know there's a change in the leadership. But because of COVID-19 and other situation, uh, there's uh, not active, you know, uh, the, the activities among the research coalition partners. So KAIST and also Georgia Tech uh, took over the leadership role. So now we are moving to the next step. Okay, so Taylor, are you ready? Yeah. Okay, so we can briefly talk about what the Equals Research Coalition is and what we have done up until this point um, for the newer members who are in the room. So as Professor Moon Choi mentioned, we support the larger Equals Global Partnership, which is made up of three pillars, access, skills, and leadership. And there are members across um, civil society as well as the private sector and uh, nonprofit sector. And so we are trying to support um, providing actionable insights using evidence-based policy and um, our research. And so the purpose at a very high level of the research coalition is to generate knowledge about the existence causes and remedies for gender tech inequalities. Um, and so right now, so as of 2023, uh, so the last research report was 2019, I believe. Um, and then because of COVID, the research coalition kind of dropped off a little bit and then we have reinvigorated ourselves this year. And so as of this year, we have 34 more active members across 19 different institutions, um, largely in the US and Europe, but we are trying to spread actually more of our researcher base more globally. Um, as Professor Moon Choi mentioned, the first report, the inaugural report for the Equals Research Coalition was called the Taking Stock Report, Data and Evidence on Gender Inequality in Digital Access, Skills and Leadership. And this was focused into two like uh, parts. Part one was really actually about compiling all of the different data sources about the gender digital gap across you know, many different countries and, and sources. And it was also identifying where there were many gaps. As you all know, you know, it's very difficult to get a hold of this data. And part two was uh, organized by different chapters based on focus areas um, of interest of the different contributors. And so we're keeping this in mind as we think to the next iteration of the report, which we want to discuss here today. And that there was another follow-up report. Um, so the first report really identified that there was a very, very significant gap in sex disaggregated ICT data in Africa. And so Dr. Arabase and other colleagues spearheaded an initiative to create a special report specifically on this topic. Um, and so that, that came out a bit later. And so those are the two reports that this coalition has published. And now we are looking forward to the next report just really briefly, the two primary activities that we focus on, as Professor Moon Choi mentioned, is publishing the reports and meeting annually. So the annual meeting is now. Um, I will skip this. So we actually started um, when we wanted to you know, reinvigorate the research coalition by having a series of individual meetings with some of the most active partners in, um, in previous years to understand what they wanted to get out of the research coalition and how we should move forward as a group. Um, the biggest takeaways from that was we needed to re-energize this community because we're basically starting from nothing. Um, and you know, I think one thing that we still maybe need to solve as a group is exactly the benefit and value prop proposition of participating in this coalition. So we're hoping that you know now that we have re-energized the group a bit, when we think about the next iteration of the report, we can also focus on what the research coalition can also offer to the members besides just some great networking opportunities. Um, we had a series of bi-monthly research coalition meetings, um, largely planning, I think actually we have two sessions at IGF uh, tomorrow and Tuesday, a, a lightning talk session about uh, measuring de gender digital inequality in the global south, and then a session about empowering women in advanced technologies, um, which is about equals related initiatives on Tuesday. So a lot of the meetings were focused on planning for those. Um, this is just briefly an overview of the schedule of events, uh, but I believe it's also in the concept note that you were handed out. So uh, yeah, I hope this gave a little bit of an overview for people who are less familiar with equals about exactly what we've done up to date. Um, but I think it's equalsintech.org is the website. So if you're interested in finding information about the other coalitions and, and other work that is going on, I encourage you to look there for more information. Thank you.
Thank you so much. And uh, there's a dinner, network dinner after this session at 7 p.m. It's about uh, several uh, the the stops away by uh, the subway, and it's Kiyon. What's the name of the restaurant? Kyo Shoton. Okay, Kyo Shoton. Yeah, yeah. So we will have a dinner there. So you are all invited. So please come and you know uh, so and have dinner together. Okay, so. The reason that we get together today is uh, to, you know, discuss about the direction or so structure of uh, the our annual report. That's most important to agenda of equals, you know. So uh, we have thought about what would be the the right direction. So there will there was a small discussions and also by uh, monthly, you know, the online meetings, and now finally we got uh, some ideas and. Uh, uh, technician team, would you please post the the second uh, the document? Yeah, it's called the planning. Yes, would you make it bigger? Okay, okay. I I think all of you have a hard copy. So uh, this is uh, the draft note about how to proceed with the annual report. To uh, there's a uh, equals vision and also there's uh, you know the each coalition assess uh, leadership and skills but so far you know it's a very much bottom up approach so we have uh, uh, you know the very active uh, stakeholders like partners and they propose certain topics and uh, you know editorial board get together and then cross the those ideas into groups and make a report but I think uh, that was the very, you know, the initial report, but now it's about the time to move uh, to work with other coalitions. So I think uh, three, like part three, uh, the, the clusters, uh, you know, uh, it will be a very, you know, form the structure and we have to discuss, you know, who will be the editorial committee and who will contribute to each uh, the, the uh, cluster. So uh, based on our previous meeting or so, you know, discussions uh, through the several meetings, I think uh, we figure out each active partner's research interest. So we tried to, to group into three. And about the assess, I think, uh, uh, you know, Professor Christopher Yu and Professor Mike Best and, you know, Professor Maria Galio and you know, also Allison and also Dr. Allison and also, uh, you know, other members have a very active project on that. So I think there are two options of a contribution. It's not about the full length, uh, you know, manuscript. That's more like a chapter. That's uh, between 4,000 and 6,000 words. About case study, it's a brief one, 1,000 words. So you have uh, choices, but we know that, you know, it's not for you to develop a new research project and you know gathering new data. It's more, I think the the annual report is more like outlet to promote your research findings, like the previous one. So, but important thing is that each cluster should have one leader, and then we are going to work with those leaders, you know, uh, uh, regularly. So, I, uh, you know, I I propose, you know, Professor Christopher, you would lead the, the first assess group. <laughs> okay, and but if other persons want to switch their, you know, the cluster or want to be a leader or want to contribute to different way, please, you know, say so, you know, we are happy to discuss that. And about the second one is leadership, that's more private sector or so, you know, more cultural part too. And current co-leader of this coalition is EY and UN Women. And about this uh, uh, the, the cluster, I think uh, our team and also Michelle and you know Kara is not here, but ITU group and also Professor Dasom Lee and you know also uh, the director Audrey Plunk and Ms. Molly Lesher. Uh, I think they are from OECD and also the professor. Pranav uh, and also, you know, the Professor Lillian and also other members can contribute to the leadership part based on what they have done. And about the skills, uh, it's lead the coalition is led by the GSMA and ITU. And about the, this group, uh, Tamara was not able to make it even online because of time difference, but, uh, you know, we proposed Tamara as a cluster leader and also Professor so Young Kim and also, you know, uh, director Helani 
Kapaya and also, you know, other uh, the members. So, but we were not able to include everyone, you know. So there are people in online, also offline. So uh, maybe there are even people who came to the annual meeting for the first time. And um, but this report will uh, we aim to publish next to probably October or November. And so I think it will be a one-year project. So you know we would like to hear from you what you think, and then. After a brief discussion, we are going to make a group into three clusters and then discuss about the details of, you know, who will do what and also, you know, how uh, the, the timeline and so themes and, you know, uh, uh, et cetera. So, okay, uh, comments and questions or, yeah, please feel free to so. There are uh, several microphones here. Or so I can walk around. <laughs> Do you have any thought over about the structure? Maybe want to be a co-leader? <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess the first thing I would say is, as someone who's been volunteered to be a leader, um, you kind of, it, this coalition will be what we make of it. Uh -huh. And um, it really is up to us to drive it forward. I think that what Moon you're suggesting is there's part of it which is taking advantage of the work we're already doing and putting it together. You know that's a big part of it. But we should also be thinking you know, about more proactively um, reaching out to the uh, uh, the each of the coalitions is doing work. Uh, they're probably not doing very good evaluation work. You know, and working with them to try to learn. So it's. <laughs> Try to make sure that the projects they do aren't one-offs, mm -hmm. uh, public relations devices, that we can actually make sure we learn what we're trying to develop measurements to what we're trying to accomplish and assessments of what is actually effective and working. Mm -hmm. And I guess we're really inviting, I think, everyone in the room, if this is going to work, if you're doing work on gender, even just uh, a brief case study, two or three page describing any of the research you're doing, uh, in all these fields would actually go a long way to making, to, to help this push this process forward. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, that, that's exactly what we are aiming to. And any comments? Uh, I just have a small one. Thank you very much. Um, I, I'm wondering if um, in order for us also to show more integration mm -hmm. with the other clusters following from um, Chris, uh, Christopher's comment, we should invite this, the uh, other clusters to contribute with um, yes. case studies, uh -huh. Uh -huh. small pieces uh -huh. that perhaps are not research, fully research oriented, but they still uh -huh. can be turned into and show the integration of the work uh -huh. with the other three coalitions, uh -huh. skills, leadership, okay. and that's a suggestion, Dr. Choi. Yeah, that's great idea. So it, it's like a small showcase of uh, what their activities from the yeah, non-academic, uh, uh, yeah. Uh, from the uh -huh. Yeah, we will uh, announce the call for contributions or call for you know, the, the case studies, so yeah, we'll do that, thank you. And any comments from the audience or uh, from ITU, right? No. no? <laughs> you introduce yourself? Maybe? Yeah, hi, I'm, I'm Audrey Plunk, I'm from the OECD. Ah, okay. Hi. Yeah, hey. yeah. Um, w we do a fair amount of work on, on gender in ICTs. Um, I think you've articulated some of the challenges uh, in terms of um, statistics uh, disaggregated by sex or gender are difficult. Um, I think we have um, some coverage in, in our work and we have lots of, of case studies um, and things like women-led um, startups and, and, and VC investment and AI and, and things like that that we do have insight uh, on a certain amount of countries relative to, to gender. Also things like ability to code and ability to access the internet and things like that. So I, I think there's some out there. Um, again, our coverage is not global in the sense of 191 countries. It, mm -hmm. d it varies on the data depending on what kind of data we, we can get our hands on. So um, anyway, um, it's a very good initiative and we're happy to help if, mm -hmm. if we can. Thank yeah. you. Thank you so much, yes. OECD group can be a part of leadership, so leadership is focused on that issue about the, uh, the, the gender issue in leadership in 
you know, the private sector. So yeah, that would be perfect field. Okay, any comments? So I'm now <laughs> listed <laughs> under the skills group, and um, I have very uh, little knowledge of uh, how these issues are addressed, at least in South Korea, but I'm sure uh, there have been a lot of report, uh, a lot of effort by the Korean government and also by the Japanese government and also some Asian countries. So although this is not specifically about uh, East Asia, when we address uh, skills issues, I think we can also aim to uh, achieve something like uh, the access group, uh, which have been uh, really doing uh, real data uh, collection efforts. So somehow, uh, although we may not be able to really uh, embark on true data uh, analysis uh, project at least, to uh, it would be good to actually con canvas the whole round of uh, surveys available around the world and then at least to have some snapshot of where uh, this uh, skills gap actually lies. Uh, I, I'm very much, I, I guess I, I belong to the, <laughs> the right group compared to the other two sections. Um, uh, I think I belong to the right group as well, the leadership. I think. Um, what we often don't think about is the number of CEOs in business uh, worlds that are um, women are significantly uh, small. And when we look at um, these, I mean, new and emerging technologies are, are, are what I study. And if you look at those technologies and how they're being developed, women are, not l women are largely ne neglected as the potential um, target market. And in that sense, uh, I think uh, that I, I think I'll hopefully I'll have something to contribute um, to to the group. Okay, so Professor So Young, do you want to move to to the more assessor group, or no, no, you want to stay? Okay, because we don't have a Tamara here, so we need a person who can lead that uh, cluster today. And Professor So Young, would you mind to yeah <laughs> moderate? Yeah, <laughs> thank you so much. So now we are going to make a small group, like, uh, and then, uh, but as you know, that this is just a start point. So, you know, we just set the goal and then leader, and then uh, each, you know, the cluster is going to invite more people, you know, not just uh, like active, you know, existing member of uh, partner of uh, coalition, research coalition, because I know that you know many you know, colleagues, right, working in this field. So it's a great opportunity to put together and then invite people. So after this meeting, uh, you know, our team is going to draft the flyer, you know, call for authors or call for uh, contribution to the 2024 research report. And then we are going to distribute that to the leaders. Uh, and then, you know, we can invite more people. Uh, we expect about five to seven, uh, authors of each uh, the, the, the uh, cluster. So we don't expect a long like 300 pages report like uh, that we did you know, previously. This is more like a shorter version, and but it will evolve over the years. You know, this is just the second you know, beginning. So, okay. Okay, let's make a, a, a let's have a break out sessions. So uh, the first assess group will get together around the professor Christopher New and and also the second uh, leadership group, uh, that's uh, me, so please come to me. And about skills, uh, uh, the group uh, can be together around the professor So Young Kim. So let's get together. So we, we allocate time about uh, half hour, so uh, we're on time. So we'll get back at uh, 5 p.m. and each group is going to present uh, what they have discussed, okay? What's your overall theme or what kind of topics each author is cover and also a list of potential authors you can invite to the group the, the, as an author. And then, you know, about the next step. And also, I just want to give you a heads up. If you serve as, uh, you know, the, the leader of each cluster, we are going to invite you to KAIST probably next uh, summer, so we can have a small research workshop, very intensive research workshop, so yeah.
Okay, thank you. And uh, let's see, come back like at 5 p.m. after uh, small group discussions. Thank you. And then maybe each uh, group, uh, brief, uh, you know, summary about what you have discussed. It's about, you know, whether uh, the, the about the topics of each partner's contribution, the title of uh, the topic, the, the chapter or case uh, analysis, and also if there are any partners who want to move from one group to another based on uh, the, the, the fit of uh, what they are doing, and also uh, maybe list of uh, potential authors of each, you know, the, the group. Okay, so Professor Christopher, you, you would you go first, and then we will move. So our group was small, but that was not a problem. Uh, Maria, Matias, and I had a very interesting conversation and we identified several possible um, natural topics. Matias is doing very interesting work with women-led community networks, and is proposing to understand in three different uh, in three different levels of of urban, rural, urban, peri-urban, and rural to understand how they would play out differently in the benefits uh, in the other ways. Um, we also are going to ask all the people at the lightning talks because. Um, we know Allison's got to be doing some work in this, you know, and we're, they're going to look at the presentations and it's a very natural thing for them to uh, leverage this. And my guess is the beautiful thing about researchers like that, they've already written part of it up. We got to find out what Lunasia's up to, you know, because you know, I know there's some gender access stuff you're doing. And so just uh, we'll touch base and try to get some ideas. You know, we're talking about two, three, four, just stealing stuff out of your reports just to, re to give you a platform to talk about the great work you're doing. Uh, we're going to reach out to APC, Georgia Tech, you know, the work we're doing, which we'll highlight in our, our talk. And then what Marina was thinking also is to probably not so much just report for existing work, but to on a forward-looking basis, something that's interesting to her, which I think is fabulously, is a great idea. Think about alternative measures of access, not just, you know, we to try to find ways to proxy for it, particularly in what I heard you say in my head, is network-based data that we can infer stuff from. Be yeah, because if we can get network pro proxies, that's information we can get. The rest of the stuff, survey, it's, just, it's so ungodly expensive. Yeah. You know, and if there's a way we can actually validate a measure and generalize it up, then we could actually do a lot. And maybe not getting absolute levels, but a minimum level. Changes in rates, you know, progress, you know, these sorts of things. And so we're probably gonna have to devote part of our section on a forward-looking basis of more speculative stuff, which is not data-based in the same way, but I don't think it matters. I think it'd be a, a neat contribution to the report. Uh, thank you so much. And uh, the next is uh, uh, Professor Tasum Lee. Um, so we are the leadership group, and to specify the leadership rep refers to women's representation in the ICT and technology sectors. And we had um, the Internet uh, Society Foundation, and they discussed how to assess, um, uh, so that Right, so let me just clarify. The Internet Society Foundation discussed the two types of leadership. One is fellowship-based, the other one is training and e-learning courses-based. So you can actually see that there's a multi-level um, uh, types of leadership going on there. And the OECD group discussed the statistics, so we looked at different types of stats going on. Um, they mentioned that they had lots of different types of data available. And what we kind of discussed was that it would be really interesting if we could just look at one signature indicator, just choose one, and then try to get into as much depth as possible. And that would maybe gain some traction and then lead to a bit more funding, a bit more you know, um, contributors kind of joining in. And what we're hoping to do is that um, uh, we kind of write about the existing research and then kind of uh, write a uh, short or long proposal too to discuss how we would actually continue to do this in the future too. Uh, more specifically on my side as well, I think what I want uh, what we discussed was that um, we want to look at, regarding leadership, we want to look at different types of corporations, so that be multi-level or transnational corporations, which would we would have to look at the, multi, the, the headquarters to see where they're geographically located, the small and medium-sized enterprises, 
and then the um, the startups which the OECD has data on, so that we can actually have a look at um, all these different <laughs> aspects of uh, corporations and leadership. Is everything okay? Okay. <laughs> yeah. So that's that's basically the gist of what we were saying. Okay. Uh, thank you so much. And Professor So Youngi, would you uh, uh, you know summarize the discussions uh, with the uh, skills uh, uh, group? Yeah. I. I we were only a two-person group, so <laughs> I'll just speak up and then maybe Ka, uh, Kalani, right? Kayani yeah. uh, can just uh, fill up the rest. So um, we have actually found interesting commonalities with uh, other the other two groups because the skills are related to access and also leadership uh, in two ways. The first one, uh, we need uh, questions like access anyway and we have to define skills very, very specifically instead of just uh, asking whether you use the internet. So the first uh, 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 point we actually agreed on is uh, we need to develop, uh, at least find really good source of uh, survey data around the world, which contains those specific, very concrete questions about different layers and levels of uh, skills. We know that there are many surveys on ICT access and also uh, related to gender, but we don't really uh, see many questions like uh, these uh, specific uh, ones. So that way, uh, we can benchmark some of uh, access questions, uh, because access questions, as Professor Dasumli and also other people said, uh, you know, questions are increasingly be being more sophisticated. So skills questions need to be more sophisticated in the same fashion. The second one, uh, related to leadership, we also uh, uh, find an interesting paradox because uh, uh, as skills gap is being narrowed down, the more gaps are actually created in upper level of uh, digital skills. So now people get to uh, obtain some very basic uh, ICT education. So we don't really see much gap, gender gap, but really, really difficult to learn skills such as uh, very fancy AI technologies. This is extremely hard to uh, uh, obtain. And then now, when even if they get uh, you know education for these really latest uh, upscale uh, technologies, uh, when they get to the job market and also when they get to work, there's a gender and you know, work and life balance, especially in, in uh, you know ICT sector. As you know, this is kind of a crunch mode, 24-hour work. So that uh, we don't really find the very high-level leaders in the ICT sector, which actually backfires because when we motivate women and girls to obtain more high tech in ICT, but they don't see anybody on uh, up there, then what's the motivational incentive for them to learn more advanced uh, technologies? So in that way, this is also related to the leadership, leadership sec uh, section. And finally, we have been discussing who could be <laughs> mobilized to <laughs> provide uh, some writing here. And we talked about UN, APC, something, and World Bank Group, whatever else. But he, uh, she has a very good idea of uh, who is uh, really available. Uh, hi. So, uh, yeah, we were just coming up with a couple of names. But, of course, I'm sure the room, people in the room will have a better idea. But we were just thinking that uh, I think UN's APC ICT was doing some work on skilling. Uh, there may be a gender angle in that work, because I think that was also some level of benchmarking what different countries were doing. Um, I know the World Bank does in their sort of digital economy assessments, they look at skills elements of all the other countries, of the different countries, and maybe also look at programs. So I don't know if we want to approach them and have some sort of conversation about taking case studies from there. But that also may be a function of just looking at what countries are doing. Mm -hmm. So perhaps if there are any good programs that countries are doing, uh, perhaps if anyone knows of good programs or people who can approach, maybe some MNE elements of a good program would be a useful contribution uh, to the chapter. Yeah. Okay, thank you so much. And uh, what about the online participant? Uh, is there any 
uh, the summary from their discussions? Uh, yeah, maybe I can just briefly summarize. So uh, thanks to the great tech team, we were able to like solve our issues and communicate with each other, but the time was quite short. So we really just got to hear about Prasi and Ayana's research and how it might fit in. And so actually Prasi is the uh, director for the Center for Media Literacy and Community Development. Um, organization in Uganda and they do uh, training for youth and women and other community members in media and information literacy so I think that you know their organization can write a lot of very interesting case study in either the access or the skills dimension and Ayana was actually describing her research as well which spans all three of the different pillars so we actually described like oh maybe there is space also to touch in the report about how all of these three pieces actually come together. Uh, so her research is about digital innovation ecosystems um, and gender inequality. So she will contribute some uh, section related to that. Thank you. Wonderful. Uh, also, uh, our team has created a gem board. Would you, uh, you know, the show the gem board on the screen? Uh, the the technician team. Uh. Okay. Yeah. Uh, but this is, but very few people uh, brought to their laptop, so it would be better to uh, show the screen. So maybe send them the 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 address, the site address, and then they can show it. Uh, what about like Zoom chat room? So you can send the link, and then they can show the Zoom screen here. Uh, Jamboard, the Google Jamboard, uh, is uh, like a post-it. So we try to, to put, uh, you know, the, the people into three different uh, groups and then going to show, visualize that. Uh-huh. Uh, but it's, it's not available now. Uh, can you uh, okay. Uh, okay. Uh, but still, like, we have a draft. <laughs> I just want to show you what it would be like. So it doesn't need to be very accurate. So just overview. Can you show the Zoom? Yeah, in the Zoom, we just share the link. Yeah. Yes. Uh, uh, not this one, the one that we have developed in the morning. Like we have full of the. Okay. Uh, okay. So it's like this. So this is Jamboard. So each group has a certain ideas. Like uh, say that you know method one is about you know some examples. So I think based on our discussions today, we are going to create a Jamboard and. We will open that for a uh, you know, certain period of time so you can move uh, yourself to from one group to another group and also write down what you want to contribute. Or if you would prefer the Google Sheet and we can make it more structured the way, this one is better. Okay, yeah. Okay, nice. So we are working this way. Okay, so now we are moving to the next, to the, the final uh, agenda is about the timetables. So that, uh, time framework, so uh, this uh, is October, and then we aim to publish it by next annual meeting. So this year, many of you suggest to have a meeting at IGF, that's why we are here, but uh, I hope next meeting will be at KAIST again. <laughs> so like we did in 2019, so we can cover accommodation meals, but we cannot cover the flight guests, but if you want to so come to Korea, you know, we are going to have a very nice uh, workshop, like two, three days in Haiti. So yeah, so in that way, you know. So annual meeting is once a year, and then on that day, we launch our the annual report, and then after that, we'll discuss the next one. So, so that's the procedure. And also, uh, important task is about editors and editorial board, but as you know that uh, so far we don't have any external funding. We'll, we will find one, I hope. So, but if we would be able to find some external funding, uh, we are going to recruit to, uh, you know, a couple of people who can work on that. 
otherwise we have to find uh, more like uh, people who are in the universities and so I'll discuss uh, some of you about that. About the editorial committee, uh, it will be uh, two editors and also research coalition co-leaders and also three leaders of the theme. Uh, so I will reach out those people and we are going to have a mid-year workshop. So, you know, I will reach out and then probably, you know, have uh, maybe a couple of days, you know, discuss about, you know, the tracking, you know, the progress of each group and, you know, the next steps, etc. And I also hear uh, your uh, experience of the previous uh, report to the, uh, I think I brought one hard copy. Uh, is there, yes. <laughs> Thank you so much. So this is the, the first uh, the report. I think many of you have uh, contributed that. Uh, so it's very thick, <laughs> 300 some pages, but we will not do that uh, again this time, probably less than 100. So yeah, it will be a mini version and also I really like the idea that uh, the Audrey from OECD, she suggested, you know, for the fundraising, it's very important to one signature outcome product that we can show, and that would be often it's a measurement index. It's like better life index in OECD. I also use that a lot to teach uh, at, at a graduate level. So maybe we can propose one signature index from equals, you know, I don't know, maybe equals empowerment index or equals assess index or something. So maybe we can propose that and, uh, you know, a couple of, you know, potential, you know, the, the funders and then we can work it together because many of us are working on the data about the, you know, the assess the skills and leadership. So, but I would like to hear more your experience and thought and strategy about also if you have any preference about timeline, uh, say that, you know, you have a big conference or event on April or something, you want to avoid that or it's central, especially like uh, active members. So, so when OECD suggested that the strategy, does that mean we need a kind of international or cross-national really large data point, right? Better life index or like human development index. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this is really huge cross national database. But so wha what I have uh, understand is that many of uh, us have a uh, system to gather data. So we have uh, partners in many developing countries. Also, OECD has a big network. So they have a system. But there's uh, no clear conceptualization of a certain measurement. But that's more research field that we have worked on, that's the novel, you know, expert uh, part to, uh, of the, the work. So I think uh, as a group, we can, you know, maybe this report, we can have uh, some concept note or something about some like potential, the, the index so we can develop and then, what do you think, what would be a good strategy? Oh, okay. 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 Um, this could be relevant and useful, especially because the database is already curated and cleaned. We will represent tomorrow the, the dashboards. So we have 29 indicators um, in three areas, connectivity, gender, equity, and freedom. Um, so if the database that is public and curated could be used for something towards, we're measuring connected, inclusive connectivity and meaningful access to information. Um, so if there's any potential for the database to be used, we could definitely oh, yeah. donate it to the, and it's already, as I said, curated and the inventory clean. And of course, it doesn't represent all the countries because there are many countries that are, has no data, but we try to select indicators that have the highest frequency, relevancy, and also representation. So if that is of interest, that could be perhaps used to thinking about that conceptualization of an equals index. That, that's exciting, yes. The one concern I always have with indexes is we tend to make them things we can count. And um, we have uh, problems with multicollinearity, we have problems with weights, mm -hmm. and there has to be you know, ideally some base, I mean, I'm not talking about anything that fancy, but some validation mm -hmm. about what goes in and what matters, because otherwise you'll, you'll count the same thing 10 times mm -hmm. and not know it, you know, and 
So I, I, how we do that, I'm not sure. I mean, it's it's mm -hmm. an interesting question because to do that, you have to have an outcome variable. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so mm -hmm. And you know, that will be tough. I'm sorry, I don't mean to dominate. I just <laughs> wanted to say yeah, yeah, following yeah. from that. that yeah, we, I think Dr. Cho, your idea uh -huh. um, of conceptual, a conceptualization uh -huh. could be an interesting tool. I mean, mm -hmm. I understand, I don't know, I'm not an economist or mathematician, so I don't know what it takes to build an index. I do know that mm -hmm. it's we can contribute with mm -hmm. a alternative way of yeah. measuring yeah. gender digital equity, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. That would be a very fantastic, even mm -hmm. if it's conceptual. Mm -hmm. And also as a, like a, a, a forward-looking piece mm -hmm. of the pieces of data that we need um, mm -hmm. that could maybe, you know, mm -hmm. incentive the coalitions to do something mm -hmm. about it, mm -hmm. so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think it's a really great idea, you know, uh, index or scale, uh, but measurement to one, like a signature one, but as uh, Professor Christopher, you mentioned that, you know, there are challenges, uh, yeah, but even there's uh, no clear research design if there's a very important concept that we suggest to measure and we can use that f I it's the brand name of equals, you know, and also we can do a lot of things and I think that's a very good initial goal and but I think uh, probably like a small like a task force TF uh, and about that how we can proceed and you know, we will discuss and yeah, and uh, it will be a fun project. <laughs> it's much also very clear, you know, we have a clear goal. Yeah, that's great, you know. And any thought or any experience? So I'm starting to think, you know, when I hadn't really thought about this. The reason you do an index um, is to shame countries into doing better. I mean, basically, <laughs> tactically, that's why you do it. And so the interesting question is, is there's one about validity and research, but there's another one is, you know, what do you really want to accomplish? And so, um, you know, everyone I know, when, like for example, when World Bank does an, an, an index, that's entirely why they do it. So, just something to think about. No, no. But one thing the idea like about better life index, the OECD one, uh, I think one of the findings is not just about like shame certain countries, it's about compare the, the internal diverse groups, for example, based on better life index, uh, there are rank based on uh, by country, right? Some country, usually Nordic, you know, European countries are always like in the top scores. And But surprisingly, you know, the immigrants have, uh, you know, once they move and then they move from the, you know, the score goes up. So it's about the system. So that's the sort of the, the findings, right? So I think uh, like that, uh, if we have a very clear measurement, to maybe we c if we do some, because there are a lot of activities by equals, you know, the champion program and intervention program, you know, also internet society has, uh, you know, e-learning and e centra but how to measure the outcomes and, you know, so I think it would be very nice to have uh, the measurement uh, issue, yeah. Yes, Professor Kirkwood. Um, I, I also think that the the goals of having an index is to specify what the what the objectives are, especially for us regarding gender and um, digital access to leadership and skills. So um, I agree with your previous comment, Professor Yu, that it's really important what we in include, the what what kind of variables are we going to include, because they're going to be used as. Um, as objectives by uh, by the countries that may not have this gender gender um, equity, so I think I'm thinking, and this just top of my, off the top of my head, is that we can just y we can maybe also do like an analysis, an evaluation of existing indices, and saying like, oh, this index is good for this reason, and this index is bad for this reason, and then to overcome that, our index provides this new an aspiring <laughs> outcome. <laughs> uh, the yeah, the super index. <laughs> okay, uh, that's great. And I, I think uh, now we have to discuss about timeline or so next steps. So, so far we have a bi-monthly uh, the, the conference call, but that's uh, preparing this uh, annual meeting. But now I think we have a clear goals. So maybe from the next meeting, we have a, a more the group leaders rather than everyone or so have a, you know, individual, the, the 
the group meetings. So we will proceed in that way. And also, what do you think about timeline? It's October. So maybe we can get the commitment, uh, like a statement, like the title of the, the, uh, the their chapter or case study and the whether they want to contribute to chapter or case study and authors and those things maybe we can done by November to, to close. What do you think? Uh, maybe not abstract, even just title about what do you think it's better to get abstract better? But you have a more experience. Ex short, one? short one? Yeah. Small, like a couple of uh, sentences. Uh -huh. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's a great idea. I think Araba did that too. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. I see. I see. Uh huh. Yeah. Uh huh. Uh huh. Yeah. Yeah. It sounds great. And what what do you think the deadline would be? November. Or November. Yeah. November. Because the third group, <laughs> we didn't have many uh, who attended the third uh, section. So uh, I, if possible, I guess the main organizers can actually post sort of end to end roadmap of the whole report writing so that it's, it's, it's something like you know, preparing a conference session. So this is the final deadline, real deadline. And then we work backtrack uh, from that deadline and uh, somehow by this time we should be doing this and this uh, so that, uh, for example, abstract submission must be do this, must be done this, 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 this. So if we have that sort of a rough schedule around the year, then it's going to be much easier to prioritize work mm -hmm. I think we can even develop a website like a uh, Google site and the uh, equals research coalition and your report to like something like that or notion or which one would be better what do you think like so we can it, it looks like conference if we have a website you know so we can remind because I think one of the challenges is that we have uh, about 50 like five zero members but Half of them are inactive. But I think uh, they might feel like we are sending spam, spam <laughs> emails. <laughs> like I also was a part of uh, in other groups, uh, in other like uh, initiative. But sometimes if we get too many emails, we start to ignore that. So, but if there are like uh, outlet, you know, website or you know, people can visit and get oriented. So, but which which are the better website or Notion or? We use a Slack actually, but that's not most popular among social scientists, right? So, yeah. Can I talk about yeah, sure, yeah. On the experience of the other report, something that we have to have in mind. I didn't understand, Dr. Choi, from your from your description of the editorial committee, if they are responsible for re reading the, re the chapters, sending them back with comments and then receiving comments back. It was very difficult to get the all that process just took a long time. I just wanted to say for this, you know, for our timeline, just to be generous with that process mm -hmm. because people don't respond in the time that they are required. So I just wanted to make that comment. And yeah, I think yeah. sending emails, even if they think it's spam, if you are committed to submit something and you don't, then I think that we should spam them, mm -hmm. like with everything we have. Okay. Yeah. So I don't think it's a bad idea to also have mm -hmm. an email reminder okay. without every week, but you know, once in a while, so. Okay, that, that's really good uh, advice. And I think uh, about the first uh, curation part, uh, you know, making a, a cluster like uh, we call group and also invite those process. I think Kai's team can handle that, you know, otherwise, you know, the group leaders have too much work, so we can curate the first phase. And then once we get the list of commit committed authors, and then we can move as a group, like that way, yeah. It, it'll be a fun project, I'm so excited. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah it's, it's, it's a fun project and yeah, so yeah, okay. Any other, also any other activities or advice or something that you want to do through equals and yeah. Or is there any conference that you go often? Maybe we can also use those things too, yeah. Is there, but many of you are from ICTD, actually, 
So any conference that there are like primary uh, conference that you usually go or gender, uh, like IGF is the most popular one. You always come to IGF. This is our first time. You are you you two are the people who introduce IGF to us. <laughs> I think that there are other events. You th would you think conferences? You are thinking about UN related conferences or academic conferences or uh, if it's so UN. Uh, Academia, we ah. are very academic. Ah, okay, so not not UN conferences. No, I mean the whole reason you do it IGF is to bring in non-academics. Ah, okay. Yeah. So that's you know this is not. Uh, like there's c there are some companies here, there's governments here. This we try to broaden it out to bring those people in. Okay. Okay. So IGF is the good one. Okay. Okay, uh, that's all I have. And then is there any questions or comments that uh, you'd like to talk or Not much? And okay, so two coordinators who worked for a year for this project. So would you give a big hand to <laughs> tell and answer? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much. Yeah, so I will see you at the restaurant at 7 p.m. Please bring your friends and we have enough rooms. So, you know, if you, anyone who's interested in gender issue or, you know, please bring them with you, okay? Thank you.
everyone. This is, is my next person here. Yeah. Hello, Smaya, we can hear you. Thank you. You're welcome. What time is it? Midnight? No, no, no. Midday, luckily. Oh, okay. <laughs> Our bit is sharing with midnight. Okay. Nice. Oh, hello, everybody. Hello, Kwaku. How are you doing? Hello, hi. I'm good, Kwaku. How are you? I'm also good. Okay. Yes. What time? What time? What time is it for you? I have I I am awake since four a.m. in the morning. <laughs> they said it's four o'clock in the morning, and then they told me it's five o'clock. So I'm waiting since four o'clock. Ah, <laughs> great. Eight. We should be quiet now. Okay, so I I I see now. So if they can unmute my video too. My video as well. Are you, are you okay now? Yes, yeah, there's the sound is coming now. Uh, Kweku, can you hear me? Oh, I can hear you. Okay. okay. Now my video is my video. We can see you all right. Thank you. They can start now. Mic check. Okay, Irasha Mase, welcome uh, from Kyoto, Japan, for our discussion entitled Leave No One Behind the Importance of Data in Development. If you're here, um, you're in for a treat. We have some dynamic panelists here with us in person, and in line with the theme of today's discussion of not leaving anyone behind, we have those who are rejoining us virtually. Before we get into it and before I kind of get into a long monologue here, I want to invite my esteemed colleague and friend, Dr. Danielle Smith of Syracuse University to open us with some opening remarks. Dr. Smith. Thank you, Yusuf. Greetings to the session's organizers, the presenters, the audience here in person and virtually, and to all those attending the UNIGF in Kyoto. I am truly honored to welcome you to this session, and I would also like to thank the people of Japan for your very warm hospitality. I'm very thankful for the leadership of Wisdom Donker and Kweku Antwi at Africa Open Data and Internet Research Foundation who are joining us virtually. Their tremendous support in planning this session has been instrumental. As we know, there are many ongoing data initiatives around the world. Implementing data initiatives in Africa can play a significant role in accelerating progress towards achieving the sustainable development goals on the continent. Africa faces a unique set of challenges and opportunities, and leveraging these technologies can help address key issues and support sustainable development. However, it is also important to address challenges such as data privacy, cybersecurity, infrastructure development, and ensuring that these technologies benefit all segments of society, including those who are the most vulnerable. In addition, governments, the private and public sectors, and civil society organizations must work together to create supportive systems for the implementation of these diverse initiatives. By effectively using such technologies, African governments can lessen existing challenges and continue to create more sustainable, inclusive, just, and prosperous futures for their citizens. The session presenters are experts in this area and can help us understand these initiatives and broader global trends, 
it is particularly important to learn about developments on the ground and from experts who are in the field. Thank you again for joining us and we look forward to, to an informative session. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Smith. Um, as I said, we're gonna get right into this discussion and for those joining us in person and virtually, we've decided to split this conversation into two main components. The first component is addressing gaps, encouraging data use and encouraging strengthening the data ecosystems. The first set of conversations will be situated in that piece here. And then the second component is leveraging technology and community networks to make sure that everyone gets connected. It's essential that we don't just theoretically have a conversation about ensuring access to data, leveraging data, but making sure that everyone is included and that no one is left behind. As I said, we have an amazing set of panelists here with us in person and online, and we're gonna get right to it. So to kind of begin, I wanna start with you. Um, let's see, Victor Ohuguru, uh, forgive me and correct me uh, in, in your um, presentation for me not pronouncing your name correctly, who's a senior Africa regional manager at the UN Foundation for Global Partnership for Sustainable Development Data. I wanna begin with you, if you can just please give us uh, a minute or two of opening remarks and let us hear how you're doing this work at the UN. We don't want to leave you behind, so let's. Well, wh while we while we get Victor, let's let's go to Kwaku. Kwaku Antwi is a leader with this collective here from the African Open Data and Internet Research Foundation. Kwaku has been, uh, as Dr. Smith mentioned, an important uh, leader in this conversation and someone who has helped to drive the conversation. Kwaku, if you could please introduce us to yourself and please inform us as to how the AODERF is, is leading the way in making sure that not just that communities have access to open data, but what are the tools that are necessary to accelerate the, the SDGs? Thank you, Yusuf, and hello to everybody. Uh, my name is Kwe Kwenchi from the African Open Data and Internet Research Foundation. Um, I'm in charge of the community outreach and projects and also in organizing events around open data initiatives um, across Africa through our network. Um, I think one of the most important um, aspects we recognize in our current dispensation in this digital world is being informed or being part of what is um, going on in our society. Um, data, as they say, is the new oil which is um, driving our economies. And being able to access data and utilizing data is also very important for all of us. I mean, as we speak now, there's a lot of information ongoing as we are participating in this year's IGF in Kyoto. And uh, when we talk about data and open data, we talk about data which is available in formats which are easily accessible on um, portals or repositories which do not require enormous and um, mitigating circumstances for you to not be able to access that data. Um, open data, we can say, is one of the biggest drivers of open communities and also being able for people all across the world and in communities to be able to access information. Um, one beautiful aspect of our open data is that it encourages not just the private sector, government, and all other sectors to be able to share their data, to be able to have people utilize this data for purposes, and where we're able to strengthen ourselves and also enforce where there are data gaps in which we can be able to share and also improve our societies. Well, in accessing this data, we all know that we're in a digital world now, and data is not just on hard copies in some um, libraries or some safe havens or safes where it is and you need to be able to have the other data which is internet connectivity to be able to access this data and that's where we also come in in which we are bridging this divide in terms of connectivity and setting up um, community networks and also helping the communities themselves 
to have the skills to set up a network, to have the skills to be able to utilize this data, interpret it and understanding the data for themselves, and also being able to transmit the data in formats which are usable, acceptable, and also safe for them. So those are my opening remarks, and um, I leave the floor for the rest of the panel. Thank you, Kwaku. I want to jump to my colleague at Syracuse University, Dr. Lee McKnight. Uh, Lee, you know, it, it's as Kwaku said, data is gold. Uh, it is valuable. Many companies are in an AI race right now where they're leveraging data in ways that are helping to accelerate their economic opportunities. But we've done work in the past around ensuring that not, not just that we ensure that data is accessible, but that we preserve people's rights. Can you talk about the relationship between expanding access and internet connectivity with ensuring that that data is governed properly and appropriately? And can you lead us into some solutions onto how you manifest that in your work? Thanks, Yusuf, and thank you all for being here virtually or in person and engaging in this uh, very important conversation. Um, I want to recall back to 2008, uh, uh, IGF in Hyderabad, uh, perhaps somewhere here, uh, there or there at that time, when the uh, coalition on dynamic coalition on internet rights and coalition on internet principles agreed that it didn't make sense to have co two coalitions on rights and principles, but there really should just be one. Going forward, it was founded the following year. Since then, there's been a charter on internet rights and principles created. Following that, over work with you, we've taken that work forward on embedding in the virtual space uh, rights and principles for governance, for whether it's for, for data rights, for privacy, for security. That now has been extended with your closely with you, Yusuf, to smart cities and communities. Any village, any community can be a smart community, can have embedded in its governance framework rights and principles, including for data rights. Uh, so that's going forward to the present, where now with the work also with the Africa Open Data and Internet uh, Research Foundation on bringing connectivity to communities anywhere in the world, we can help ensure that the, the rights and privileges to citizens' data are, chose, are determined by those people who live there and they're not, not automatically harvested by external forces without the consent of the community. Thank you. I think along those lines, you know, we, have, we have the honorable, can we just say this again, honorable, uh, Samuel Narty George, a member of parliament from Ghana here with us. And Dr. McKnight explicitly mentioned the importance of ensuring nothing about us without us, in essence, that we should not be accessing and determining governance principles around data without ensuring that the communities who are directly impacted have not just a voice but are driving the conversation. Can you talk a bit about the role that you as a member of parliament can play in ensuring that data governance is inclusive of the voices of your constituents and the work that Ghana is doing to accelerate access to data and making sure that the data ecosystems are secure um, and respecting your citizens' rights. All right, thank you very much. Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, um, depending on what part of the world you are in. I, I believe that the conversation about doing this for everyone, inclusive of everyone, is extremely critical. And for me, it highlights a, a major disconnect because we have this conversation about the West leaving Africa, but we don't discuss the disconnects inside of our own countries in Africa between our capital cities and the rural communities that are underserved or unserved. Because governments and parliament has to take decision on the basis of data that's generated. A lot of this data is generated from e-government portals and services that people access online. Now, the question you need to ask yourself is, the connectivity in Accra, for example, is different from the connectivity in a rural community in the northern part of Ghana. And so that data, that parliament or the Ministry of Finance is going to be using to advise parliament in terms of resource allocation is going to be skewed based on the data, that the source of that data, which is skewed towards the urban areas where people have higher spending 
power and are able to buy data because we joke about it, but possibly what I spend on data in a week is actually a whole family up north, uh, the whole subsistence of that family of six people for a whole month. And so the question is, if data is not as cheap and accessible and platforms are not accessible, people are not contributing to the data pool. And so we need to look at the disconnect and the digital gaps inside of our own countries on, on the African continent between our urban areas and underserved areas. And that's where the community networks come in. And that's where you have um, in Ghana, for example, our Universal Access Fund, GIFEC, trying to close that gap and do last mile connectivity. But then I keep saying that we, we have a lot of conversations and on these platforms about connectivity, bridging the connection, the connectivity gap, but we're not talking about whether that connectivity we're bridging is actually accessible uh, or affordable. Because it's one thing to bring a network into a community, it's another thing determining if it's at a price that the, 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 the individuals in that community can hook up to the service. Because if you don't get the data from the people in the underserved area, we will continue to make decisions in parliaments, in capital cities that are skewed away from the needs of the people on the ground. And so that's where the real disconnect is. And that's the real quagmire that I think we need to figure out how do we get, because government is increasingly making its decisions on the back of data sets that are generated by people's, by, by digital footprints of citizens. But if in our countries we have citizens who do not have a digital footprint because they don't have access to internet, or even when you bring internet at very economically affordable prices, the cost of smartphones is inhibitive because as, 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 as there are various segments to connection. It's the connectivity itself, then the cost of the connectivity, and then access to that connectivity on a device. And so for me, I'm beginning to champion a case of saying that just like in pharmaceuticals, where you have generic drugs, because the big pharma, big pharma has made profit from its uh, intellectual property, and so a drug that's produced by Bayer or, or Pfizer could cost about $100 for a sachet, but I could get that same drug by an Indian generic maker, same efficacy, but not the same brand name for $5. And we're doing that in pharmaceuticals, we should begin to do the same thing in technology, where the likes of Apple and Samsung have made a lot of money off their intellectual property, we should begin to have generic devices that are going to be cheaper, that are assembled on the African continent, and then would make it easier for people to have digital footprints. Because a citizen without a digital footprint cannot be part of the data sets that government is using to take decisions for them. As I said, honorable. Um, Dr. Uzma Alam here from Science for Africa Foundation joining us virtually. Dr. Uzma, really appreciate you being here. As a public health practitioner, data is key to understanding how we can solve, especially in context of the pandemic that we've left, are kind of leaving, or may still be in, depending on where in the world you might be, data has been tremendous in both deploying public health resources and understanding how we are going to be efficient in ensuring everyone is taken care of. Can you please share with us a bit about what you're doing at Science for Africa Foundation and the role that data will play from a public health perspective? Thank you for that and uh, greetings everybody from Nairobi, Kenya and you know, a big, a big thank you for the organizers. And it's been really exciting for me to you know, hear the, the panelists who came before me because where we are, like where the Science Africa Foundation plugs in, we are, you know, towards uh, the end of, we would be benefiting from what some of the panelists have, have started doing, especially in, in health. So the Science for Africa Foundation, just, you know, for context, is a Pan-African organization where we fund research and innovation in South Africa, but we also uh, work with <coughs> designing programs, and providing, you know, ecosystem strengthening. And within that, we have a science policy engagement portfolio. And that you pointed out to, you know, looks at how can we drive value from uh, African 
African generated data and how do we actually simulate what Yamaha's honorable um, member of parliament just mentioned, how do we ensure that Africa is responsible for you know, generating its own data, but also how do we govern that? And I think you know, critical issues and threads of this have come up, but something I just would like to highlight for, for context of this conversation is, you know, when we have been hearing the word data, 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 but I think within data, what you know, our work's pointing to and what uh, you know what I think the discourse should be focused of, or, or you know, to even answer your question directly, what will take us from data to impact is really those nuances and within data. And what do I mean by that, right? So yes, there there is data, but there is this need for you know diversity, equity, and inclusion in data. So we've already talked about you know waste driven data, a footstep you know footprint that doesn't match the African content. But within that, you know we have our our women. Let's let's not forget them a big piece when it comes to comes to health and and you know especially the next pandemics, right? And within that, there's also this whole uh, <clears throat> concept within Africa that we really need to. You know, if if we need to get from data to preventing the next pandemic, like you said, so or even drive impact, is this piece around governance, right? So Africa, yes, needs to generate its own data and we need to be responsible for governing it. But there's this piece that you know we need to appreciate that data is obviously cross-cutting, right? Whether it's health, whether it's agriculture, whether it's finance and stuff. And what some of our work has been pointing to, especially when we start looking at governance around. Uh, data policies in Africa, you know, they're housed very specifically within, uh, for example, majority of the ICT, you know, or equivalent ministries of health, right? I mean, ministries of ICT. And that obviously has implications for how somebody in health can access that data, even at a local level, even within governments, right? And there is this, this fine balance of what, you know, uh, what the mission of one is, and you know what the mission of the other is. I think you know my rallying call to for this conversation, and you know to, to get from data to impact would be yes. You know we need equitable partnerships. We need you know locally generated data, and that includes devices for it. But we also need to be very careful of how we govern, that we do not start governing in silos. That you know when the data exists. We can't even have access to it, even at a very high level. So I think I'll stop at that and hand back to you, Fred. Thank you. Wow. Um, I think we still have Victor uh, Ohurugu on the on the line. Victor, please, if I've again mispronounced your name, I am a stickler for saying people's name right. So please let me know if that's the case. Uh, but if you can please talk to us about your work at the UN and, and in particular how. Uh, the UN is trying to bridge the gap between all of the respective conversations we've had here. We have the academia here, we have governments here, we have civil society here, and the UN plays an important role as a convener. What are, what are you doing at the UN, and, and how do you see these issues of data governance, particularly for Africa, manifesting themselves in ways that help to facilitate the sustainable development goals? Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Can you yes, hear me? yes, we, we, we can hear you. Yeah, I thank you, I'm Victor, Victor Horogo. Um, yeah, so uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, of course, good evening for some of you in some other parts of the world. Um, I'm Victor Horogo. Uh, I work with the Global Partnership for Sustainable Development Data, uh, which is, you know, uh, warehouse within the UN Foundation. Uh, the UN Foundation is where we are currently, you know, uh, seated. Uh, the Global Partnership is a growing network of over 600 participants uh, or partners, which includes state actors and non-state actors. Uh, these non-state actors are civil society organizations, the private sector, research academic institutions, you know, uh, developer, you know, communities across, you know, the world. And these actors are set across about 35 countries uh, in Africa, Asia, Latin America. And the Caribbean, and we are collaborating together to accelerate progress on sustainable development and on the SDGs, particularly, but through better data. Um, so, together with our set of partners, we have looked at uh, and we are collaborating across three key systemic issues that have been identified together with our partners. And one particular set of that issue focuses on timely data. Uh, we do believe and we have seen across the world that governments particularly need data on a very timely uh, basis to making decisions 
and enabling the various policy instruments that they do put together. But this government are not having that, you know, uh, quick access to information, to data. And so we're helping governments to make use of both non-traditional, you know, uh, data forms and technologies that could help them have, you know, the best and quickest access uh, to this data. We also look at the issues of inclusive data, where we want to see marginalized groups, you know, have more agency in the data value chain. People who, you know, have been left out. Uh, we're ensuring that governments and all other actors within the data value chain can focus on this set of people. And the third component of our program looks at accountable data governance. You know, we're trying to unlock the opportunities of data for all, uh, making sure that data is well governed, you know, by certain standard principles. And so what do we do in a particular country? My role covers Africa pretty much, where we have seen that there is a huge issue around capacity. Uh, just understanding what data is across different levels, both in the political and technical space, understanding what type of data is needed, you know, to drive certain policy, you know, issues, understanding how to even use that data in itself uh, is a major issue. And so we have various programs that focuses on building capacity uh, in terms of, you know, understanding what type of data is needed, where to source that data, how that data can be used. And we're working with both, you know, uh, all the actors within the value chain, particularly governments, but ensuring that we can strengthen, you know, connection and partnership between the private sector and government uh, to drive the agenda of data. You know, we want to see how that data is given its prominence within the political space, particularly. Uh, it would, you know, of course, not be too surprising for many of you that a lot of government actors, you know, make decisions that are not data driven. You know, of course, politicians, you know, are pretty much focused on what, you know, will get them into the place that they need to be. But oftentimes, very many of them do not reckon with data. So how do we push the political profile of data within government, but also working with the technical, you know, level guys to ensure that they have access to the right data sets? that they need uh, to support government in their various decisions and policy making process. Uh, and so um, I will look forward to, you know, how that, you know, we could have a broad based conversation that bring all of the actors together and we could work, you know, with all of you to address, you know, the issue of access, availability and the use of this particular data uh, for policy and decision making within the continent. Thank you very much. Thank you. And thank you for correcting me in the pronunciation of your name. Uh, you know, as we said, this conversation will be split into two. Um, I want to advise those who are joining us virtually that our colleague, uh, Lahari Chowdhury, will be able to uh, collect your questions. If you are joining us virtually and you have any questions, Lahari Chowdhury will be able to collect your questions in chat. That way we can make sure that we are including everyone in this conversation. So as, as I said, the first component of this conversation has kind of been addressed. We've, we've talked with our dynamic panelists here. Um, and I want to jump to, and I think actually uh, Victor helped us really transition into the second uh, component, the second piece of a conversation, which is leveraging technology and community networks to make sure that everyone, um, making sure data gets to everyone. You know, uh, Dr. McKnight, I'll start with you first. Um, I want I, I don't want to assume we have we're all operating on the same set of understanding of what community networks are and how we can leverage technology to both advance community networks and make sure that data gets to everyone. So can you do two things for me? Um, can you first explain what are community networks? How do we ensure that it can be utilized as a mechanism to ensure access to data for everyone? And then talk a bit about um, some of the work that you're doing around this particular set of questions. Sure, thank you so much, Yusuf. Uh, so first, uh, we can uh, think about community networks uh, and uh, give a lot of big credit to the Internet Society for all of its advocacy and work over many years in encouraging uh, people to think not just of uh, telecommunications or national level networks, but the fact that people can, in fact, build and create their own local networks. Um, and that, so that work has been ongoing for some time. Um, I, I wanted to bring in here one example, maybe as this transition from the first part of the conversation to the second, and I'm qu I forget her name, I should remember her name, but uh, the mayor of a Chilean community that was previously disconnected until there was a community network during the pandemic. 
She said, we exist. That's now she's part of the data pool. Yes, that she has to have uh, rights and be protected, but now her community, she exists in a way she didn't before. So community networks provide a way to now bring connectivity to people, the 2.5, 2.6 billion people that exist, but they're not counted. They are not included in any way, uh, generally speaking, in our conversations because they cannot reach us uh, digitally. All right, so now how do we go about this today? There's many different technologies available to create community networks and that great work has been done for some time. We here at, at Syracuse University, working with uh, the Worldwide Innovation Technology Entrepreneurship Club, or YTech, over decades, have developed a package small form where it's not enough to have connectivity if you don't have energy, right? You cannot stay connected for very long, your battery life. So having a package that includes both a connectivity solution and, act and is a tiny little mi portable microgrid solar powered, that's been something that we've been evolving and has been uh, deployed into over 20 countries now uh, and is currently uh, in use in uh, Ghana uh, for connecting school children, libraries, and further. As its first deployment was in the Democratic Republic of Congo. So it's possible now, it's not like it's, this is not theory, this is just something that we, you come see it in the exhibit booth. Uh, otherwise, you could have a more established, a larger community network with established towers and so on, but you don't necessarily need to create any new infrastructure. We talk about being the academic here, infrastructureless networks. So we can have an infrastructureless network that is not just a network, it's also a microgrid that exists, that's, you can go see it. So this is not theory, this is fact, and we can take this, there's 2.6 billion people that need to be connected, they exist, I'll stop there. You know, honorable, um, and thank you for that, Lee, I, I'm, I'm struck with the we exist comment um, that kind of struck a particular core with me. And you know, Ubuntu is a concept on the continent of I am because we are, this notion that we are, we have an obligation amongst and with each other. Uh, can you talk a bit about just the way that we go beyond, and I, I thought you put it beautifully, beyond um, connecting people from a very kind of academic or kind of theoretical perspective, but what does that do to demonstrate that we exist? How do we, how do we unlock people's fullest potentials by providing them the access to this to the, to data as well as the internet. Well, um, it literally just transforms the world. It changes the entire economics of that locality. And I'll give you a typical example of something that a project that we're toying with in, in Ghana at the moment. If we were able to connect an unconnected community and then we could send them educational material. A young man who hitherto would have had to go to a city center to learn a trade or go to a master craftsman could actually with a smartphone take models in how to become a bricklayer or a mason or become a skilled laborer. And that gives him an employable skill that puts food on his table. So. This ability to run blended learning platforms are critical. COVID taught us a lesson in Ghana, where kids who were not connected to the national grid lost a year of school. If we had community networks, we could have, because we, we actually put educational material on the internet and on national TV. But some of these communities had absolutely no connectivity, be it electricity, TV, or internet. And so the kids in those schools have lost a year of their lives, thanks to no fault of theirs. Now, if you're able to connect these communities, you transform the whole ecosystem there because there's someone there who's now going to be able to run a business center. Is going to, his, I mean, it brings a whole new lease of life to the people in there. And so, I mean, most of us in these rooms, even in capital cities, we do a lot more with data on our phones than voice calls. Our lives revolve around data. And, and, and that should just, you can just imagine what happens if you don't have data. The first thing people ask for when they walk into an establishment, especially for all of us who've traveled here, 
first thing I did at the airport was not to change money. First thing I did at the airport was to get a data seal. Because it's the only way I can stay connected. It's the only way I can stay productive. If I don't have data, I'm cut out. And so if we're able to bring people to a place where they're connected, you actually open a whole new specter. You just need to see the excitement in communities that get connected to 3G for the first time from 2G. Because when they're just doing voice, they have absolutely no connection to the internet superhighway. And now the internet is actually where everything happens. The young people who've graduated school in urban areas who are able to make a livelihood by trading on Facebook, being able to sell, uh, they buy things, they, they have a Facebook page or an Instagram page, and they're selling. Now, imagine that there's a young man in a rural community who also has the opportunity to now become the guy who, if you need anything from the major city, he goes to pick it up, puts a little margin on it, and people in that community can actually just deal with him on WhatsApp. It doesn't even have to be on Instagram. He can run a business page on WhatsApp where he advertises his, his wares and he can transact business there. So there is real economic power that exists when you give people connectivity. Because, I mean, many of us take these connections for, for granted. We're, we use them for TikTok and Instagram and, and Snapchat. But the internet has real economic power for people who are in the most difficult positions. And, and that's the power of transformation that we can bring. When we, when we let people realize the transformative, positive impact of the internet, either for business or for educational purposes, there's a real life opportunities that can change the whole specter for people. And when people get these skills, it's now a digital world. He can be sitting in that village and doing data processing for a blue chip company in the United States and get paid Forex because he, now he's gotten He's, he's able to lend data processing or lend, lend, lend coding online. Those are all opportunities that hitherto he would have to leave that community and travel to an urban area where he most likely has nobody and be exposed to all the vagaries. But you can bring the world into, the, the, into, that, into this small device in the hands of that young person so long as you give them a connectivity. And I think that it's, it's something that as governments and as parliaments, we need to begin to prioritize, to identify these communities and begin to reach out to them as a matter of, of course. Because for, 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 for the telcos, most of those communities don't make economic sense for them to go into in the first place. Because they're looking at the numbers, they're looking at the cost of running this, their, their infrastructure. And so when I hear Doc talk about infrastructureless connections, those are the kinds of connectivities that we need. And for the kids who are using those connections in Ghana to access um, educational material, that's material they would never have been able to access. But kids who are going to write the same end of year exams with them who are in urban areas have access to those same materials. So you have kids going to write the same exams but are completely disadvantaged from the get-go. Now, how do they pass and compete with these kids in the urban areas for limited slots in, in public universities? So this, this, this just bridges the gap and, and creates a whole new vista for these young people in, in, in those communities. And that's why it's very imperative that we take this as a very serious point. You know, I, I will be very transparent and say that I am a professed, avowed, and committed Pan-Africanist. Uh, and Kwaku and I have had a number of conversations personally around Pan-Africanism and the role that it plays in both facilitating a brighter future for African descendants across the globe. Um, but Kwaku, if you could talk to us a bit about what open data and community networks can mean for helping to not just facilitate the UN Sustainable Development Goals, for not just unlocking, as the Honorable uh, mentioned, the fullest human potentials of each of us, but also to build a United States of Africa to kind of facilitate for this connected, inclusive continent. Thank you, Yusuf. And um, I think uh, the Honorable Member of Parliament has given us a segue, and I think Dr. McKnight also spoke about it. Basically, when we talk about open data and also the the infrastructureless structure where you're able to access on portals and with technologies and the data. It's important for us just not to think, um, I think 
Dr. Usman talk about silos, okay? To not think about our domains where we are looking to ignite or digitalize or to push for, for the technologies to apply. And we're just talking about education, okay? But there's, um, there, there is endless possibilities to the innovation of the technologies and the data. So for example, I'll just give a very short example we had this year. This year we did an open data day in which we celebrated open data in Accra. And what we did is that we brought together um, persons from the statistical part to the open data. We brought people back from the private sector in terms of those who use geospatial data technologies. And then we brought the, um, and we brought the space science technology. And guess what happened? They were talking to people, they were talking to themselves in the room. They were doing very similar jobs which required a lot of data from um, um, a disaster, from climate to um, uh, economic data to private um, geospatial data for all sorts of purposes. But guess what? They were transforming our communities. And what was there? The connection. What is this connection? Is the connectivity to be able to connect to the internet, to be able to talk to people, to be able to exchange. Today, I'm able to connect to you from where I am in Accra, Ghana, due to internet connectivity. I'm knowledgeable, I have that information, I'm sharing with everybody because I'm connected. I'm connected because we are not, um, uh, uh, we are all in an open um, environment in which we can share information. And this information is being recorded and it's gonna be reposited in a portal or at a storage place where everybody can access. And this is the power and transforming nature of internet connectivity and the power of data and information that it brings and the richness to it. In Africa, we have this potential. And yes, we should and we are able to transform our communities with this kind of data and information that we have. Because being here and being having that internet backpack in Winneba or in Tamale or in Wa or in Ho, I should not just be able to connect with the school children who are in that community, but I can also con connect across the country. Not only so, but the cloud infrastructure that is available for you to be able to access should you have also interactive capacity in which is not just for education, but also our healthcare facilities, our agricultural facilities, and also all other facilities who are able to connect as we are doing across the continent. And yes, Yusuf, it's important that we recognize our capacities and being able to enhance it in the African context to be able to connect everybody, as you said, Ubuntu. We are all moving together in this forward together and we go ahead with everybody ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Kwaku. Dr. Uzma, um, you and then uh, Victor will be the last two before we open it up for conversation with those of us in the audience. Folks who may have questions online, please do send them in chat and Lahari Chowdhury will make sure to get those questions to us. And for those who are in the room, uh, please, uh, you don't have to run up to the mics, but you're welcome to also join us for questions. Um, Dr. Uzma, the question for you is centered around good health, well-being, gender equality, and um, let's let's leave it with those two issues first. Um, you know, we we we've talked about unlocking and unleashing everyone's potential. We've talked about the way that connectivity can ensure uh, people's fullest potential can be maximized. But from a practical, pragmatic perspective. Um, this can have significant implications on ensuring good health and well-being and gender equality for women and girls. Uh, two of the, uh, of, of the 17 uh, SDGs addressed there. Could you please lean in a bit about those two topics for us? Because we don't want to make sure that we want, we want to make sure that we are not leaving out an explicit call out for uh, gender equality, for making sure that women and girls are included, uh, as well as good health and well-being. Dr. Uzma. Oh, thank, thank you for that question. I, I love it. It really got me more excited. So, you know, it's if if we if we pin our our work around those those two pillars you've said, right, and then bring in this piece of connectivity, it's it's actually what everybody has said, right? It's life changing, and it's life changing not only for for the end users, but in 
earnestly is going to be all of us. But what it also does is it uh, changes how research and innovation is done within the African context. So that's you know very critical. You know, this dialogue has been saying we need to drive our research agenda. You know we need to drive our innovation. But then you know as soon as we start saying that, then we need to start thinking how we're going to fund this, right? And the only way we can you know ensure that there's that we take off not take up the boxes, but you know we we leverage on all these different areas, whether it's gender, whether it's you know uh, data, whether you know you want to call it connectivity, is through these linkages, right? And the way I would like to look at these linkages or connections is is through community of practices, right? And just to give you a small example of what this means in in practice and in, in how it's implemented, right? So we are very focused on when we fund for whether it's research or innovation to fund within this, this hub and spoke model, right? And where you have a lead organization that works with, you know, other organizations around. And these can be, you know, the private sector, the academic sector, the government sector. And when we say lead institutions, you know, the importance for us was like, if we just look at the funding landscape, right? Whether it's for health, whether it's for innovation, whether it's for agriculture, finance or whatever, in Africa, you know, there are pockets of where the funding goes. We know South Africa is strong, we know Kenya is strong, uh, we know some of the North African countries are strong, but Africa is huge and there's capacity across our 54 member states. So to ensure that we leverage this, you know, our model says or works around the, the philosophy of, all right, you know, you're a stronger lead institution, but you need to partner with the other stakeholders and, you know, bring in these other players that wouldn't have access to, to this, right? And what that all of a sudden does is creates equity for us, right? Whether or not only in how we fund, but also, you know, how we bring in uh, women leadership, how we bring in other stakeholders, how do we connect government uh, to, to researchers and to data. And for us, so that's a big piece of equity. So connections and connectivity to community of, you know, practice, all of a sudden translates into equity. But another thing, you know, a critical thing, and I'm surprised it didn't come in our first discussion, is when we think of data, there are lots of trust issues. We need to be honest, right? Even within academics, even within the experts. But once you provide this, this framework for sharing knowledge exchange connectivity, you know, there's this trust built, so that already then translates into sustainability. And sustainability is a big part of how uh, health is going to play out on the continent. And I think one other piece that's, you know, really powerful for us from, from the health perspective is, again, when you think of, you know, connecting that first conversation we had around data and, you know, the second conversation around connectivity, there's this piece of endogenous knowledge. And there's a lot of endogenous knowledge in Africa that's not pinned upon. And just to give you a very quick example. So I remember responding to Ebola in, in you know, Sierra Leone, Liberia, and Guinea. And I remember, you know, there was this whole thing about isolation and stuff, and we were, you know, having this academic conversation of how we're going to do this X, Y, and Z. But all of a sudden, because we had this connectivity and we were on very, you know, networks within networks of communities, you know, it was the endogenous knowledge that drove this because somebody from Sierra Leone said, hey, you don't need to do this. We already do this. We already have isolation centers for our women and children, you know, when they go through uh, measles or when they go through menstruation and stuff. So we literally, that was knowledge, that was data that existed that we could leverage on. So I think, you know, just, just to end, it's, you know, life transforming and for us, in the end of implementation, it, you know, drives three things, equity, endogenous knowledge and trust. Wow. Uh, we, we have a question online, and Victor, I'm going to direct this question to you. Um, it comes to us from Daria uh, Tamareva. She notes and asks, how could we effectively implement data for the humanitarian sector? We, and then another question, um, uh, I'll, I'll, say, I'll, say, I'll say the second one with you, Honorable, which asks, uh, we lack digital skills. What can be done to rem remedy this situation? So, Victor, the first question for you is, how could we effectively implement data for the humanitarian sector? And then a question on digital skills and remedying that uh, for, for, for you, Honorable. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so, how could we implement data for the humanitarian sector? Um, uh, so for, for us, um, we we one of the things that we you know come to discover is that 
um, the within the principles of you know uh, leaving no one behind, we we've come to realize the fact that um, the development sector straddled with, between the public sector and the private sector seems to be very much advanced uh, uh, as the private sector is, but within the public sector space, uh, there, there is, there's a lot of capacity issue. Uh, and, uh, and so our concern is how do we bridge this capacity issue that enables the public sector, particularly coordinating with the development space in the private sector to respond you know, uh, more effectively to you know, humanitarian issues when and when they do break out uh, in Africa. And so we, we're looking at a couple of things uh, particularly within the public sector space to strengthen their capacity in responding uh, to, to humanitarian issues. Of course, when uh, COVID broke out, it has, of course, humanitarian you know, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, dimensions to it. And what did we do with a couple of countries across Africa? One is the fact that we did discover that infrastructure was a major, major challenge for the public sector in responding to issues uh, such as humanitarian challenges. Infrastructure such even as computing infrastructure that enables them to bring together all the key information and data sets uh, that enables them to make quick decisions. So we were working with a number of the presidential task forces on COVID-19 uh, to, you know, uh, of course, bring in our private sector partners, looking at where infrastructure is needed for immediate deployment and where, you know, causing that partnership to occur. Second is the issue of uh, our, our capacity, knowledge and skill in using this infrastructure and data uh, to making the decisions that governments, you know, are needed to make at that point in time. And then we identify what are those capacity related issues and brought together a set of our partners who are helping to train public sector officials across Africa in identifying and using the type of data that is needed to support governments in making decisions. We have you know, partners like Grid3 who was working with a number of health institutions, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the national statistical offices across Africa in a couple of countries to bring the sort of data sets that they need, both from the economic side, the health side, you know, just you know, mashing this data set together to provide analytics and insights to enable government to make a decision. The third area was the area of uh, the capacity around understanding sovereignty issues with respect to data. This data that is needed you know, for decision purposes are being collected from a set of people across various communities. We were opening the eyes of government to ensuring the fact that these people whose data is going to be collected and used must have a say in the way that data is being collected from them and in the way that that data uh, would eventually be used. And so we wanted to ensure that everyone whose data is being used must have a say, they have a right, uh, their rights as well must be protected. But more importantly also, we saw that a lot of folks from outside of Africa were all jumping into Africa, demanding for data from government, you know, using that data without recourse to certain principles, sovereignty principles uh, in those locations. And so we're opening the eyes of government and strengthening the capacity to manage this data set in terms of understanding that the first uh, issue has to do with ownership. Governments within those spaces where those data sets are being collected must exercise ownership uh, over such data. We also wanted to be sure that we're, we're, the, those data sets need to also be located within the confines of those countries. There were countries that were willing to work, but they insisted that the data sets must not leave the shores of their country. They must be used for the purposes for which they were collected for. And of course, the issues of privacy and protection, you know, how data moves from one country to the other, you know, even building the capacity of governments in terms of governing that whole data space itself was a major issue. Governments across Africa, in most instances, the public sector institutions that handle these processes don't have real capacity within the issues of data governance. So we're also helping to build those capacities to ensure that the data sets that are going to be used are, you know, are, 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 are limited, you know, to, to, to the borders of that nation, but of course also are very much, you know, the people comply with the protection laws, the confidentiality issues uh, that that data brings upon all of us. Uh, so in a nutshell, the, uh, the humanitarian sector needs data uh, and critically, how do we help them is also making sure that the data that they need uh, can be available 
it's accessible in formats that they can take and use this data for quick decision making. And so we, we are hoping that uh, one of the things that government in Africa would really focus on is in data infrastructure that enables data systems from across various institutions to be connected together and to grant you know, better access to everyone, particularly within the government sector who needs to use this, this data uh, for policy and decision making. Uh, thank you. Honorable, before you, before you jump in, um, are there questions in the, if, if you have questions in the room, please uh, line up and we'll make sure to get you honorable and then we'll have these two questions. Yes, please. Sorry. Oh. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm just going to keep it short so you don't have to stand for too long. Um, basically, when it comes to education, it's, it's a very simple process. We, we need to be able to work with civil society and the technical society to build the capacity and do the training programs. Members of parliament need to be able to, on our own, we can offer the training, we can give the training, but we can partner with civil society organizations and, and, and technical society to bring the skill sets to our constituents. So for example, I could put, I could put um, a quota from my constituency development fund towards acquisition of the skills and then run them as boot camps so that the local constituents are able to get some of these digital skills. So I think it's going to, and, and then that's just at the level of the member of parliament, but government as a whole must begin to look at how it can also run these programs. In Ghana, for example, we have the Girls in ICT program, which focuses on girls in second cycle schools, takes uh, a, a, a basically a, a roadshow to the schools, trains them in basic, uh, code writing and, 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 and hacking and ethical hacking and gives them some kind of digital skills. And so governments can be able to invest in those kinds of programs as well. But ultimately, the resource must come from private sector, civil society. We must be able to build those synergies and, and give those skills to the people. Thank you. Um, my name is Jarrell James. I founded something called the Internet Alliance uh, and I've done a number of cryptography projects before this. I work in a deeply technical field on emerging technologies around cryptography for quite a while. And so I'd like to ask a question specifically around leverage. And as someone who's a, a devout Pan-Africanist, I do think I, this is very relevant. When we talk about like Walter Rodney or Thomas Sankara, do we think that their values around African intellectualism, African like ingenuity and valuing that as a resource is do we feel that that is reflected in the way that African nations are are leading their countries with development around data sharing when uh, Victor spoke about not really letting data leave borders um, I mean in a lot of ways when we work in cryptography it's like data can leave borders but it can only be accessed by those who have direct um, cryptographic, cryptographic key access to that data. And there is this idea that Africans are just supposed to share everything that they have for the sake of development, for the sake of checks, for the sake of you know, investment from expat. Um, so my question is really around like community networks and all of this stuff is really great, but are we f is there ways and better approaches to leveraging data as an actual asset? Leveraging the fact that GSMA predicts the greatest boom and growth in internet uh, users is going to be Africa and is Africa year over year. So when someone comes in and builds telecommunications infrastructure and they choose not to go to a, a region that seems to be not profitable, well, do we feel that there is room there to say, well, if you want access to this data, we have leverage over you. Can we develop more? I just want to hear some thoughts on this. Because it seems like we're operating from a very, from like a very subservient position there. I love the question. I'm going to take the second one and we'll, we'll try to get both. Okay, sorry. Okay, so my name is Emmanuel from Togo. So uh, mine is more like a contribution um, because recently I work with APC and other organizations on the reports regarding data protection on the continent. And what we notice is that on the continent, we are leapfrogging, like um, we are collecting too many data. I mean, in our countries now, you see the telcos are collecting, the hospitals are collecting, everybody's collecting data. So the consequences in the future can be very huge with all the emerging technologies we are seeing today like AI. So the consequences for the continent, we have to be careful. They will be very, very huge. And uh, it is important for us to develop our data protection laws on a human-based approach. 
human rights based approach because most data protection laws on the continent today are not developed you know on a human rights based approach and by human rights principles i mean the accountability there are a lot of data breaches in africa today but who do we hold accountable so there's that accountability there's also the discrimination equality empowerment and legality um, i know a lot of countries in africa today are actually enacting data protection laws for the sake of a check so it's something that we have to actually also see that is it really necessary for us to collect this kind of data because we call it two main data if i take the voters for example in my country they collect their biometric data, they take their picture, they take their 10 fingers, like they take all those data, but the government does not have any infrastructure locally to store those data. So those data are somewhere in Belgium with a private company. Nobody have access to those contracts to see the accountability level of those type of contracts. So three million voters have their data with a private company somewhere in the world. So those are some of the aspects that we have to also look at. I know in West Africa now, yeah, they are building a regional uh, data registry for countries like Benin, Burkina Faso, uh, Togo, where the World Bank has actually put in more than $300 million to actually um, build that registry. But the problem is that our government usually, because if I take the case of Togo, they took that check, and before taking the check, the prerequisite was to vote a data protection law. They voted the law, but there's no agency to implement the law. So there's no need to have a law if we cannot implement it. So those are some of the things that we have to look at when we are actually uh, voting those laws. We have to be able to implement it. We have to be able to actually fight for our data. Right? We have to know who has access to it, to what level, can we correct it and all those kind of mechanisms? We have to put them in place before you know going for those checks. Thank you. Honorable, if we could do this in a rapid fire, um, and I, I, I don't, I would be remiss if we didn't afford the folks who asked the questions to continue the discussion. So we'll continue the conversation. We'll probably have to walk outside to do it, but I, we'd be happy. We'd be happy to do so. Honorable. I honestly wish these questions came like 30 minutes ago, and I agree with you. Africa doesn't know what we're sitting on. We're being exploited. Most times when we talk about exploitation in Africa, we think of just the, the, the natural resources, but data has been exploited big time. It's been exploited because the big demographics are sitting on the African continent, and we have leaders who just don't understand the whole, the whole economics of data, and, and it's a big problem. And I think that there's an awakening coming, and the point you just made, and, and this morning's parliamentary track it was a point I made to the panel. I said to them, it appears as though we come to these platforms and there's a checkbox that countries need to tick. So we need to have data protection laws, we need to have cybersecurity legislation. We run back, we go past the legislation, and then we get good ratings by international organizations. What they don't do is then find out, Africa has some of the best legislation, but implementation is zero. So there should actually be a matrix of checking implementation of legislation that's been passed. Because for example, you have Egypt that has a data protection law, but there is zero implementation of data protection in Egypt. And so there is no value to the citizenry there. Nigeria had a data protection law and just, just only three months ago set up a commission. Okay, so there are real issues here, but the international community is interested in saying, oh, this country has passed a data protection law, they're doing a great job. And because we want to please Western capitals, because of the corruption of African leaders, we're unable to actually deal with what is really requisite. But I think we're running out of time. We'll continue this conversation, but I think that we need a new generation of African leadership that knows that our data is critical and we need to hold it. With, with that, we are at time. I want to thank the panelists here for all of the conversation that you helped to drive us towards. Give the panel a round of applause. For the folks who are online, thank you for joining. Uh, unfortunately, we, we, we've got to go, but we, we will continue the conversation, and we look forward to having you all join us at our booth. It's in the main event hall, uh, excuse me, in the main exhibition hall. You can find us at uh, ACIP. At org, org. We're next to the kimonos, apparently, so grab a kimono and talk with us. Uh, and Dr. Smith, did you want to say anything before we close? Well, yeah. Um, I just wanted to say quickly to the 
brother um, because Pan-Africanism is about recognizing our humanity. The idea of a United States of Africa relates to your question and I don't think it's as futuristic as it seems. Um, it's actually an idea that has been talked about from the OAU. So I think Walter Rodney's idea of Pan-Africanism is really Africans at the grassroots level. While we need the politicians, they have their responsibilities and roles. We cannot achieve this goal of a global Africa, of a United States of Africa without the mass mobility of, of the young people, of grassroots people, and it's important to leverage the technologies that we have to move this social movement of a United States of Africa forward, and we can achieve it. Perfect ending, thank you.